James chapter 4. Yep, I'm about the family. Amen. I love the family. Uh, James chapter 4. Now we're going to focus a little bit here this morning on uh, we, we've been studying our adversary, the devil. Wow. And we've run through a series. This is probably the 13th lesson, I think, if my numbers are right. And today, the topic for today's lesson is putting the adversary to flight. Obviously, the adversary we're talking about is Satan himself and those forces that he musters or has the devils of hell. Uh, we refer to them in common vernacular as demons. And they're the, he's the prince of the power of the air, so these things are not physically seen. We're talking about the things that aren't seen that are actually real and they're there and we have to contend with them. Uh, it's in the spiritual realm. And sometimes it splashes over into the physical realm and affects people physically, especially anything to do with sin probably has something to do with a devil someplace. Amen. So uh, we want to look a little closer at what James says in James chapter 4, and I'll read the couple, ver three or four verses there, ver beginning with verse 1, and we want to focus as I said earlier, on putting the adversary to flight. And last week we spent a little time on, uh, on that, just a little. We just began to touch on it, so today we'll uh, kind of pursue that thought just a little bit. But he says in James 4, 1, from whence come wars and fightings among you? And obviously he's addressing people here, say folks, and, uh, and anybody in the world today. Uh, and we know that statement, that question to be true. Come, uh, come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? That's a question. You put a little thought on that and you think, yeah, I guess you know, they're right. That's right. Uh, ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. And we won't take the time to expound on each word but each word has a lot of power to it and a lot of implication, a lot of meaning. Uh, but we want the principle here that we can find and then some verses that will help us focus on our abilities through the word of God and the power of God to put the adversary to flight. So we won't, we won't uh, expound or do the expository thing on each word. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. And that, that now we're hinging on a privilege or a promise. Watch, ye ask and receive not because ye ask a myth that ye may consume it upon your lust. We get that thing turned around and meet the condition on asking. God begins to bless and begins to come through. But the lesson won't be about that. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, and, and that doesn't mean just to the physical fornications of the world that we're so uh, understandable of, <laughs> but to the spiritual aspect of things, when people are bowing to the demonic forces of hell and the devils of hell, that's all spiritual adultery against God, spiritual fornication against God. That's what that is. Quite a vivid illustration. God not real pleased with that. Now watch, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? That's where it starts. We ought to know that. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. If you like the world more than you like God, the church, you have an issue. And it needs to be dealt with. It'll be a heart issue. Either you're not saved and you need to be saved or you're so backslid you look like one of the devils himself, themselves. So here, and this is skimming, and then I'll give you three points here. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain? You can depend on the scriptures. The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. Now, if you're saved, you have the Holy Ghost of God or Holy Spirit of God in you. 
but he giveth more grace, there it is, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Very powerful words there. Uh, there to be pondered, probably be a good passage to memorize for any child of God or any Christian. And God's given you a portal to escape the oppressions, the struggles, uh, the depressions that come with this world and the forces of evil, Satan and his devices and Satan and that, those devils. So many Christians live in fear and fall in defeat every day before the devil. They get saved, they're saved. And I'm not questioning your salvation today, uh, but look, just because you're saved doesn't mean you're exempt from the pressure that's gonna be put on you by your, your, our adversary, the devil, and his forces. And he works hand in hand with the world, the things of the world, sin, devices, carnality, and a lot of Christians get in a trap and they live in fear and they fall to the devil every day. They're defeated every day by the devil because they do not realize the biblical principle that I'm going to talk about some of them today. They don't realize the biblical principle that it has, he has, let me say it like that, and his forces have actually been deactivated once you become a Christian. Now, he can still mess with you, and he will. And if you don't know what you have in Christ, you'll live in that defeated trap. You'll live just like the world, act just like the world, want to do just what the world wants to do. You'll condone sin. You'll say it's okay, it's all right. And, but you don't have to do that. You say, well, I like where I live. Okay. Whoop it up. See how that works out for you at the judgment seat of Christ. That's another message. That's why Paul said, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord. You see, you don't belong to yourself once you get saved. And that's a good thing because we self-destruct. You belong to the Lord. You belong to him. You're a child of the God. So you're a child of, of God. And there's a relationship there. And he likens it to a relationship between a man and a wife. And no man and no woman that is married would put up with the opposite spouse committing any kind of adultery, fornication. And that's exactly the teaching here because I just read it to you, five minutes. Ladies, if your husband comes to you and says, oh yeah, I committed adultery on you this week, you'd be showing him the door after you burn all of his clothes <laughs> and his $50,000 truck and his $35,000 bass boat, huh? And yeah, and guys, if your wife come home to you and say, oh yeah, I, you know, I had an affair down here. I'm in a relationship with the guy down at the coffee shop and you know, I just needed you to know, I'm, you know, got a little, how long would you put up with that guys? Well, you'd show her the door so fast you say, why? And that's the illustration God wants you to see because you can identify with those feelings because you're human and, they're, and they're, they're evil, they're wrong. You wouldn't put up that five minutes. How do you think God feels when a child of God has spiritual fornication or adultery with the world? That's the picture he wants you to see. Oh, okay. So if you know the heavenly father, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ and the free pardon of sin, I'm talking to you today. Live like you love him. He surely loves you. Don't sin against him. Don't blaspheme him. Don't go against his word. Oh, I, I just didn't know, man. I, 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 I thought it was okay to go get drunk. You know, what planet are you living on, man? Where's your normality of common sense? Oh, well, that's why I say a lot of Christians live in defeat and they don't get in the book, they don't get into church and the next thing you know, 10, 12, 20 years down the road, they're a, they're a basket case. Oh, I'm born again, I'm saved. I got saved when I was 10 on the bus route. Okay, good, maybe you did. But 
you sure done a miserable job living for the Lord. You've had an affair on him after affair on him after affair on him, and you don't belong to him. And once you get a grip on this, it's a little easier to live for the Lord. Well, I'm going to be true to him. I don't want to bring a reproach on him. I don't want to make him look bad. I don't want to go against his word. Just like a husband and a wife, once you become one and you're married, oh, I want to please my husband. Or the wife may say, I want to please my The husband may say, and he should say, I want to please my wife. And if the church is the bride of Christ, and it is, then the church has a responsibility and that same focus, that same thought, that same principle is, is shown forth in Ephesians 5 in different places. That relationship is to be cultivated, nurtured, you say, why? That's how you stand. That's, why, that's how you stand against the devil. Because if you have a man and wife relationship and you guys are in love and you love each other, when the ups man comes along and says, hey, honey, I brought your stuff today. How about me going and getting a cup of coffee? You're going to look at him and say, look, bud, I got a 12-gauge shotgun cocked and loaded right there. If you can get your face out of my door, I'm going to blow you away. Say, what is that? That's probably a natural response of a good wife. <laughs> Flip it around. It could happen with the husband. He's hard at work and the secretary comes over and bends over and says, hey, honey, you sure are looking good today. What's he going to do? Now, here's what he ought to do. Look, I'm going to knock all your teeth out and you're going to need <laughs> surgery to get you back up to speed, to get away from me. You say, well, that's not scriptural. Yeah, it is. That's because you don't know the Bible. Joseph went into Potiphar's house, and the king, wife, wanted Joseph to have an affair with her. You say, what'd he do? He got up and ran. Well, she held his coat, and she had his coat, but he wasn't in it. Say, what is that? That's a normal response. And let me say this. That's how it ought to be with Christianity. That's how it ought to be with you and God if you're saved. Now, if you're not saved, whoop it up. You're headed for hell. You need to get saved. But if you are saved, there's a relationship between you and God. When you first get get saved, you may not understand. When you first get married, you may not understand you know, but you know this, man, I love my wife, I love my husband, and I want to please them. And that, as a child of God, I want to please God. I want to do right. I don't want to go against God. And hence, if you do, that's considered spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication. So uh, they are, my thought here, Christians, they get defeated every day uh, by the devil because they're ignorant of the relationship between them and God. Man, they're just, okay, they are convinced that they must go down in defeat because they have not appropriated the principle that Jesus Christ through his death has rendered Satan inoperative and has given us means of victory. Now, years ago, it used to be if a guy had a wedding ring on, <clears throat> And some gal, man, that's a, I like that guy. I like, you know, man, he's got talent. He's got skill. I'm going to see if I can go get to know him. She eases over there, you know, but she sees that ring. Oh, he's taken, he's married, and she walks away. But it ain't that way anymore. Same vice, flip it over, works the same way with the man and the woman. But see, people ought to know you're married to Christ. If they don't, tell them. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm, I don't drink. I'm a Christian. No, I don't smoke that stuff. <laughs> say, why? Well, if you don't take that kind of a stand, the devil will run your life for you and he'll run it into the ground. He may not send you to hell, but I'll tell you what, he's going to make your life miserable. He's going to make your home miserable. He's going to make your marriage miserable. He's going to ruin everything about you because that's what he does and he does a good job at it. 
Say, well, what do you do? I stand up here and warn you about it and give you the verses on it and the Bible on it and pray to God that you'd cultivate your relationship with God just like a man cultivates his relationship or a wife with her husband and their love grows. We've been married 55 years this year. We was chatting on the way over here and I had a couple granddaughters in the back seat there and we were chiding with each other and laughing and carrying on. I was making fun of Brookville. She was making fun of New Trenton and we was having a ball. Well, I grew up in New Trenton, you know. This. She grew up in Brookville. I tell her it's the slum. No city would have a, uh, you know, a sewer system right on the edge of town. When you, you know, I give her all that grief, you know. Then she says, well, yeah, your town doesn't even have a stoplight in it. I wouldn't. So you say, what is it? True love, man. <laughs> we was having a ball, laughing, carrying on, talking about them 24 grandkids or 25 soon to be. I say, what is that? That's a relationship that we've built over the 55 years that we've known each other. And you see, the real relationship is when you get saved to build that with God. So 50 years down the road, if you should, God should tarry or whatever, 20, 30, 50, you could say, I've got that kind of relationship with God. Let me say this this morning. I can say that with my Savior. Don't do everything right, but I want to walk with him. Yeah. Can two walk together, at least they be agreed? Yeah. So here there's a principle uh, that Christ uh, actually appropriated these principles for the child of God. Question, do you struggle living the Christian life? Ask yourself that. Well, I'm saved, preacher. Good. Do you struggle living the Christian life? It's a good question. You need to think about that. Oh, I, I, I thought you was teaching this to somebody else. No, I'm teaching to... You and you and you and me. So are you submitting to sin or are you submitting to the Savior? Are you more prone to, to submit your life and your desires and your love toward the things of the world? Or are you more prone as a Christian to submit yourself to the love of God, the church, the word of God? The Christian life, well, that sounds boring to me. No, it's not. Take it from my experience. I've gone more places, done more things, seen more things, enjoyed myself more, spent more of somebody else's money than I, God's money never have in my life by serving God. Amen. And people say, oh, the Christian life's boring. My life's been anything but boring. So this morning... Questions that I would put forth, do you struggle living the Christian life? Well, yeah, well, everybody has problems, but I'm here to tell you, he has appropriated scriptural principles whereby we can live a victorious Christian life and enjoy ourselves. So let me develop a step further the promise given to us here in James 4, 7. I read all the way down through verse 8. But in that promise in verse 7 of chapter 4, resist the devil, here's the promise, and he will flee from you. And now that's a simple principle. Oh, oh yeah, but it's, it's just so easy to go with the world. Why is it so easy to go with the world? I'll tell you why. You're blinded. That's one of the devil's favorite devices to blind you of truth, purity, righteousness, joy, true love, blind you of those things. And if he can blind you of just two or three of those things, you'll have trouble in your Christian life. You'll have trouble. So here, uh, as we further our concept here, resist the devil and he will flee from you. How many times have you heard somebody say, oh, just resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But we never do it. But you can do it. Have you ever <clears throat> had a piece of chocolate cake? Now, hands ought to go up all over the building. Yeah, I eat chocolate cake. No, I'm allergic to chocolate. Okay, vanilla cake. I don't care. Something you really like and experience speaking again. Boy, you put that on your plate and you begin to eat that thing, eat that thing, eat that, and it's good. 
And when you get done, you look over there at the cake pan, you look around the table, nobody else is watching, and you get another piece of that cake. And you eat that when you say, why? Because it's good. And man, it's good. And then you get bigger <laughs> and bigger. <laughs> Quit laughing, Nick. And bigger. <laughs> now, just because Jeff lost all that weight. <laughs> you say, what is it? I'm just illustrating to you how easy it is just to do the things we like and the pleasure. And, you know, pretty soon they'll catch up with you. And you've got to take metformin like me and... Bonnie, <laughs> hands all over the building. <laughs> we're all sugar, sugar addicts, so we're taking. You say, why? Because it was good. Let me flip to the spiritual side of it. There's pleasure in sin for a season. Amen. So you got to be careful of that thing, although we understand the indulgences of life and just eating a simple piece of cake or pie, but the devil's the same way. He's tantalizing. He's got the neon lights flashing. He's telling you it's okay to go this way. It's okay to run with this crowd over here. And the next thing you know, you've been anesthetized to the right things, to the spiritual things, to the godly things, to the church things, to the Bible things, and you actually think it's okay to go do what the devil does. And the next thing you know, you're off the deep end down there you're calling your friends up at church fanatics uh, so when you develop this principle and we don't resist it we don't resist that second piece of cake you say well I know I shouldn't eat any cake okay then how simple is that well the Bible says resist the devil and he shall flee from you you know what if you would resist that second piece of cake and go sit down on the couch and drink a bottle of water or a glass of water or iced tea or whatever you like you'll forget about that cake in a little while and it's done the devil's the same way when you resist him he's got to flee from you say why the Lord Jesus Christ appropriated that for the child of God it's a principle and a doctrine that's set down we just don't resist the devil you say well why don't we we're blind and he subtly slips in, puts the blinders on you, and lets you think it's all okay, and it ain't. Then we wonder, why am I so miserable? Why am I depressed? Why am I oppressed? Why don't I feel good? Why do I hate church? Why do I hate the preacher? Huh? Now, I won't go any further with that. We have a promise James 4, 7, and we must claim it that we might have the victory over the power of Satan to resist. Listen to me now. To resist is not to run. You're not running from it. To resist is not to run, but rather to stand and face the adversary. And that's why the devil flees because could I say it like this? He's a loser. I'm quoting the pastor. He's a loser. And what side do you want to be on? The loser side or the winner side? Well, ain't no person in their right mind wants to be on the loser side. So you want to be on God's side. All you have to do is resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And that, you won't even think about that, that second piece of cake because you already had one. It was pretty good. And if I eat two, I'm going to get heartburn anyway. So, <laughs> amen. <laughs> what are you talking about cake? I don't know. I'm talking about food today. I did have three points. We, the first point, and I didn't quite get to it. I'll give you those three points. Uh, and I, I'm talking about resisting here, resisting the devil Peter said it like this, and we're very familiar with 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, uh, talking about the roaring lion. But look at verse 9, he says, and he's talking about Satan and his devils and his forces. These are two powerful verses, and it speaks of the principle uh, of the appropriation that God gives us to defeat the devil. He says, whom, and we see that word again, whom resist steadfast in faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So we deal as saved people with the same conflicts that the world deals with every day. And brother, once the world gets a foothold on a person, 
They won't even know how bad a shape they're in. If you've worked out in the world very long at all, you've got to work with somebody that's probably succumbed to some problem, some sin. Let's just use drinking. Uh, we could use a hundred different things, but let's just use drinking. You know, if a guy goes home work around these guys and they drink uh, a beer every night, and the next thing you know, they're drinking a six pack every night, and they're not really drunk, but they're just buzz, and you know, they go home and then say, well, yeah. Then they're drinking two six packs a night, and they don't even know it. And then that, now they're drinking three six packs a night. Said, what do you? Yeah, I've been out in the real world. I know what guys do, and probably gals too. Of course, it might not be beer that you're hooked on. It might be wine, a strong drink of some other kind, or it could be some drug, something like that. And the next thing you know, you may do it every day, and you say, I'm not a drunk. Have you ever heard that? You're a drunk. Oh, I smoke pot. It don't bother me. It don't bother me. And they get real aggressive with you and say, what's wrong with you, man? It's all that pot you're smoking. We've been on job sites where guys about fall out with you, man. It don't bother me. Look at me. I'm fine. And now you look at them now, 20 years later, they're in some kind of homeless shelter someplace. Say, what happened? Sin got them, man. And they get a child of God the very same way. You know I'm telling you the truth. So we got we to gotta have a guard up. And God has appropriated that. I wanted to say, number one, we have the power to resist the devil. Very simple point. Oh, I'm a weak person, Brother Phil. Yeah, I know you're weak, but God ain't weak. Jesus Christ ain't weak. This Bible ain't weak. If there's one thing the devil hates, it's the word of God. Every time the Lord Jesus Christ was confronted by the devil or tempted by the devil, he defeated that with the word of God. Do you know you could take two or three minutes to memorize that promise I just give you, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I've already got it memorized. Oh, Brother Phil, you don't understand. There's, uh, I'm just, uh, I can't memorize anything. Okay, I'm going to give you a two-word solution to your memory problem. I'm going to show you with two words how you can memorize anything. You didn't know I was that smart, did you? I'm not. Let me tell you what they are. Repetition and work. You say that thing 35 times, get a piece of paper out, and write it down 100 times. Well, when you were in school and you were bad, they made you write a sentence 100 times on the blackboard and you still remember what you wrote. Yeah, hard work and repetition, you can memorize. Oh, resist the devil and he will flee from you. I probably could say that 10 times here. And psychologically, they tell you in speech class, if you'll do that and you will repeat that phrase over and over again, when they go out of there, they'll be saying things like, resist the devil and he'll flee from me. That's good. Uh, we have the power to resist the devil. And that power is not in ourselves. We are weak. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ, which indwells us. And the, we need to get a grip on this. The great truth of Ephesians chapter two comes into mind here in Ephesians two is that Jesus Christ has resurrected and ascended and enthroned in glory. And I and you as believers are enthroned with him. See, what are you talking about? <clears throat> Look, he's already walked every step to Calvary. He's already suffered the penalty of death. He's already paid the sin debt. And now if we're in him, we're, he's seated at the right of the Father. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are seated together in heavenly places. Now, you're not there on your own power. You're there in his power. And you say, well, yeah, I know I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you on a spiritual level right now, and we're, we're pretty physical. But on a spiritual level, a, a, a level of faith, our faith is encouraged by the Word of God, strengthened by the Word of God. And with that spiritual level, we can lay hold to the promises of God. Oh, I just never... I, why do you think in school they had you memorize the multiplication table? 
So that any time in life, I know some of you didn't make that, you didn't get it done. But you still, you have a, I know, a calculator or cell phone. I get it. They had you to do that because once it's committed to memory, no matter what math problem come along, if it was multiplication, division, adding or subtracting, especially multiplication, division, one's the opposite of the other, you could actually work some of that stuff in your head, and if not that, a pencil and a piece of paper, and you had it down because you remember two times two is three, I mean four. <laughs> you say, why? Because you stave off the complications of getting conned by somebody else. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And it works the same way with God. And when you get this thing down and you've got it memorized, you're going to be able to stave off the devil. He's going to have to, re, he's going to, have to flee from you when you put him to the test with the word of God. Well, the Bible says... That over here in James chapter 4 and verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So, well, how do I know when the devil is, is bothering me? Well, if it doesn't line up with the word of God, amen, then blame the devil and claim that promise. Well, somebody says, hey, we're smoking doobie uh, in the backseat of the car over in the bus. You know, come on, or I don't know, it could be anything. I, we're breaking windows down, you know, I don't know could be anything. We're throwing rocks at the cars and the over, I don't know, it could be anything. When something comes up and you say, huh, that don't seem right. But you feel the pressure, the peer pressure and the influence of those people, devils, then I would say that's the time. Resist the devil and he flee from you. That's the time to say, I'm not taking that second piece of cake. That's the time to say, I think I'll go over here. You guys go ahead and break all the windows you want to. I'm not doing it. And guess what? They'll leave you alone. They don't ask Joe. He ain't going. He wouldn't do it before. He won't do it now. And pretty soon you build up that kind of resistance to the devil. So here... Uh, if we're in Christ Jesus and we are, we're seated together in heavenly places. Ephesians 2, 6, I don't know if I read it. And hath raised us up together, made us to sit together in heavenly places, Christ Jesus. We're his, he's ours, and we, we sit together. So he's appropriated for us in his power a way to defeat the adversary because we're in him. We can't do it in the energy of the flesh. If you try, you'll fail every time. We have an authority over Satan that exceeds the authority that Michael the archangel had. Let me use that for an illustration. That's the book of Jude. That little epistle right before the book of Revelation. Because we are the redeemed. And you say, okay, what happened over there? Well, in Jude... It says, Michael, will trust not bring a railing accusation against the devil. Now, you understand how we're created, okay? You've got God the Father and then all the created beings. And then you had Lucifer, who was the anointed cherub that covers in our earlier lessons, and he fell. Uh, but then you had Michael and the archangels and so on and so forth. And we talked about the hierarchy how that thing is set up. And the Bible says man was created a little lower than the angels. So we don't have any authority over any spiritual angelic being like a devil or any of that. And so even Michael in the book of Jude said, look, I'm not, there's not I bring an accusation against the devil, but God. Say, what do you do? He, he, he says, I, I don't have any power. I'm an archangel. And man, I, I wield a sword and I killed 185,000 one day, but I have no power over this guy. But God, say, what was he saying? He was saying, well, if I resist the devil, he'll flee from me. And guess what? In the power of God, you got that same power as a child of God. You say, why? Because, yeah, you're the least in the, in the hierarchy of the creation and humanity's way down, but he was created a little lower than the angels. And the, the, the only thing under us is a dog, the animal kingdom, a hog. Uh, I don't know. You say, well, where, where do you get off telling the devil to get off? I get off in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm nobody. I'm no, I have no power to defeat the devil, but he does. That's a spiritual thing. I've done gone to preaching, quit teaching here, okay. 
Uh, so if Michael couldn't do it, but only in God's power, then that's exactly how we do it. And secondly, I had three points. We have the purpose to resist the devil. Uh, so we need to be reminded that we need and have God's authority. And this authority is to be exercised by faith. And that's how you do it. You say, okay, by faith in God, I'm going to do something spiritual today. I'm going to resist the devil. Every morning you get up, you say, well, if I resist the devil, he'll flee from me. He said, Lord, I'm resisting the devil today. Because he'll test you every step of the way. So we have the purpose to resist the devil and the purpose is simply uh, the principles God gave us and the fact that we're a child of God. So if we do not believe the word of God on this doctrine that we're talking about, we have never and we will never have victory in this life. Secondly, Satan is a defeated adversary anyway. He's a loser. We said it earlier. Pastor Jeremiah said it a few weeks ago in one of his messages. He's a loser. Revelations chapter 12, 12, if you're questioning whether he's a loser or not. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and to the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he, hath, he knoweth that he hath but a short time. You know why he's on such a rampage to get every child and every kid and every person? He's got but a short time. And the book of Colossians 2.15, as I close out to my third point, and having spoiled principalities, this is Christ, and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. If Christ did that, we have the power. We have the purpose. And then... Paul said to those Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 2.14, he says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. It's a pri And my last point is this. We have the privilege to resist the devil. And under that thought, we have the privilege after salvation of being a child of God. And ain't no dad or ain't no mom ever let, if they're thinking right, any harm come to those kids, those babies. Why, you, you let a mother with a newborn baby or a young baby, you let, you let that baby be threatened while you think you met a she-bear in the mountains and hills of Tennessee. She'll come unglued on you, say, what is that? That's natural affection. And she'll go, she'll, she'll go to a demise herself. She'll harm herself to keep that child out of harm's way. Amen. You know, our Heavenly Father is our Father. We're His children. He feels the same way about us. He don't want the devil messing with you. And he's appropriated a way and a plan and a promise and a privilege where we can, we can put him to flight. You say, well, how often do I have to do this? Can I do it once in my life and I'm good to go? No, because you live on this earth, you're going to have to do it every day of your life until the Lord comes or you die one. You say, why? Because we're, we're, we're carnal, we're flesh. We're susceptible to that interference. Just like turning the radio on. Well, I'm really dating myself now. You're going to play static. And that's how the devil wants to play with your Christian life. Doesn't want it to make sense. So lastly, we have the privilege to resist the devil. We are the sons of God. Summary, do not try to resist the devil in the flesh. Amen. <laughs> Uh, it can only be done by faith through the Spirit of God. Weak Christians can't resist the devil. I should ask that question again. Uh, maybe I've got a different question here. Maybe with, Do you resist the devil? Brother Phil, I'm awful weak. Look, I hear you. I feel you. But it's not a valid excuse because God specializes in weak Christians. He helps weak Christians. 
that Bible says in Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now, I'm not a big sports fan. But if I should speak this name, I just wonder if you would know who I'm talking about. His name is, I think, Lamar Chase. Does that ring a bell? You'd have to be a Bengals fan, I guess. I'm not really a good Bengals fan. But isn't he a running back? I don't want to get him wrong or something. And he has, number one, he's a black guy, an athlete. And they was interviewing him the other day, and he had his arms folded like that. And I saw the big guns out. You know what he had wrote on his bicep there? He had Philippians 4.13. I don't know if he's got that all right, but I'll tell you what. He might have learned that lesson a long time ago. I don't know. And I know you're not supposed to tattoo your body. I get that. But he had Philippians 4.13. Say, what's that? I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengthens me. Say, why? Because, look, Christ made the way. Christ paved the road. Christ has the power. So we have that privilege. So question, do you resist the devil? Or what are you doing in your life to resist the devil? Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a chance to teach. Thank you for your word. Bless now our song leading, our services, our specials. Bless the preaching hour. Save that one that's nearest hell. Encourage the saints. It's in Jesus, and we pray and ask it. Amen. God bless you, and good morning.